Welcome to Expedition Self on Ohm Times Radio with lifelong learner, entrepreneur, and creator of the worlds of Expedition Self, Sam Parado. Sam shares four decades of studying, guiding, and teaching how to go inside so we can build an incredibly powerful, dynamic, and validating relationship with the self. Expedition Self is laced with stellar, unexpected insights about what it means to be human. Listen now and ignite your self-development process with Sam Parado. Well, hello. Good evening. You are uh, listening to Expedition Self, and I'm Sam Parado, uh, right here live. Um, so welcome, welcome, welcome uh, to my world of self-development. As I was listening to the intro, I thought, you know, when we first did that intro, it seemed like it was too long and too wordy, but I have to say, it feels true. It's what we're trying to do here. Um, so um, I'm glad you're here and you're wanting to learn a bit more about how to go inside and why it matters so much. And, you know, I am a firm believer. I live what I teach, um, that growth work makes a life uh, more and, and it certainly has in mind. And I've watched it over and over work with others. And I think the reason for this is because inside of ourselves, we're wired to run at the first indication of like two opposing things. And most of us don't naturally see when the heart shuts down inside ourselves and can't find a way through. Right. So teaching the mind how to support us when that happens, which is really the equivalent of um, these two opposing things. Right. The heart closes and something's in front of us looking for us to pay attention to it. So the idea that we can teach the mind how to support us when that happens. Right. Teaching the mind how to acknowledge and recognize the heart and and being able to stay engaged and attentive to what's going on inside our beautiful human selves. <laughs> I think it makes all the difference. And, and, you know, it's not that things haven't happened in my life. Like things that I'm the source of, they, they certainly don't fit uh, textbook positive outcomes. <laughs> but, but what does happen is that I'm actually there for them. And I'm integrating and I'm processing them and I'm willing to feel the emotions that come with it. I'm learning how to love myself for being human. And of course, how that unconscious is it so at play at my life and I think everyone's. So each one of those occurrences or outcomes, it helps to, oh, I don't know, strip me down so that my like egoic philosophy right, of what I think I am or how I think it should go, well, it alters and it transforms. So this is what I'm talking about here. And if you've been listening to me for a while, you know that I love, love, love to talk about growth work. It's my favorite subject. And if I'm tired at night, which I am uh, tonight, I find myself in a conversation. Well, if I do, that's working on that growing edge with others. Well, snap my fingers instantaneously and I kind of am wide awake. And so that's what I hope to inspire for you. A place where you can feel the calling to go inside in new and different ways or or maybe even as part of the beginning of your process if you've never really thought about what does it mean to really go inside. Oh, so I'm going to remind you this is a call-in show. <laughs> you can call in and ask about your going inside process or add a thought about what I'm saying, right? Anything is good. I, I know it makes it uh, more fun for me to do the show when you call in. And the number is 202-570-7057. And I'm in a new time slot. If anybody is listening, not in this time slot, which is Tuesday nights at eight. So if before when you were listening to me on Wednesdays at five and you couldn't make it, well, now maybe you can make it. So we're tonight, we're going to talk about soul meet human and human meet soul. When I, when I was thinking about the topic for tonight, I, I had images of my own journey when I would struggle because the human side of me couldn't figure out how to allow or invite or make room for my soul self. And I wanted to talk about it with you because 
I just think it's so important to helping you stay on your journey, right? We need that, that, co- that contact point, that space where it just uh, fills in, right? All the, all the uh, little pockets of being human. I also want to say that no matter what you believe faith-wise um, about your soul self, that my conversation tonight takes the case that we have one, that there is a soul, it lives, and, it, and it's within us or through us, or around us, <laughs> and, and I'm going to refer to it in the way that I think of it. But please know, whenever I do that, if you can fill in how you think of it, uh, that's fine, because the point of my conversation tonight isn't to uh, debate beliefs, you know, beliefs versus mine, but rather to examine and ponder and discuss the place the soul occupies when you're doing human. Yeah, doing human. Eating, driving, cleaning, walking, talking, working, watching, (laughs) sleeping, doing human. It's that every moment you occupy your body and you're interacting with life by breathing, doing human. So on first blush, It looks like the body, with all of its glorious, magnificent systems, are engaged to function, right? The heart beats, the brain fires electrical impulses, the muscles expand and contract, the the belly processes food and water and distributes it so the body can operate. But there's something else at play, and I'm suggesting this something else is the soul someone or there's some school of thought uh, that I was told that the soul weighs 13.8 ounces and sits in a little spot right behind the heart. Well, whether this is true or not, I actually kind of like to think of it that way, right? It's, it's not tangible. It's an ethereal, shapeless uh, pith of spiritual presence connecting us to other realms, other dimensions, other beings, powers greater or more evolved than us, Uh, the spiritual collective and and maybe the collective unconscious. Again, however you want to interpret soul, is it's your choice. So you might have heard this phrase, we're spiritual beings in a human body, but we think we're humans in a spiritual body. Right. So I posit that it's possible that this, this, actually is a core lesson we're here to stand, understand. But of course, I have no proof of anything that's true. <laughs> so so what could we be learning about here in this human form or this spiritual being in a human body? Well, maybe that the tangible, the untouchable, the denseness of being human must be seen beyond and through to acknowledge the boundarylessness of spirit in all moments. Okay, that, that seems like a possibility, right? That the tangible, the touch, the touchable, right? Being human has to be seen beyond, right? The boundarylessness of spirit. Or maybe we're supposed to experience suffering and pain through a lens that's not limited by the feeling of suffering and pain in and of itself. Or... Hmm, maybe it's to discover that love is present in all things, because at a soul level, all things are never ending, or they're always working for our evolution, which some might call the highest good, and that they're not up for assessment the way we might typically do in our human selves. Okay, these are just some possibilities about why would we be spiritual beings in a human body instead of human beings in a spiritual body? I think I had that reversed. But, you know, this whole idea that we think we're human, right? And then we think we have soul versus, no, we're souls, and then we place human on top of it. I, uh, I heard a story recently about the Buddha and this, the gift of anger, and it, it goes something like Buddha was, I'm not going to do this perfectly, uh, but Buddha was speaking to a group of people, and this man kept yelling and attacking him, right, angry and enraged, right, and amped up, 
And and the more he did this, the more Buddha went on speaking in the same even tone, uh, essentially ignoring him. And and the more he ignored him, the angrier the man got. And so at the end, the man asked the Buddha why he ignored him. And Buddha said something like, well, who owns a gift if another doesn't accept it? All right, who owns the gift given, even the idea that anger is a gift if the other doesn't accept it? And I was struck by this story because when you're talking about soul level wisdom, it usually has us contemplating how to transcend the human experience of hate and anger and disappointment and pain and jealousy and selfishness, right? How to transcend it into something that is bigger than the moment or the perceived threat and uh, to transcend it, transcend it where you see that there is love and that there is non-reactivity, right? Like you, you stay in a, within yourself and you don't get rattled. And of course, t- the difficulty with these spiritual teachings is that the human parts of us don't let go easily, they don't let go easily. They're, they attach. And so that's what I really want to just sit in this evening. Why is this? <laughs> what does it look like? I, I, I would like you to think about it yourself. How do you relate to this idea that we're spiritual beings in a human body versus we're human beings in a spiritual body? Right. And and what's really going on between those two aspects, human and soul? You know, I've used the word ego on a number of occasions to describe the survival driven part of the self that has to develop and inflate in order to survive the very suffering that our soul selves are here to transcend. At least that's how I think about it. And so so you could think the ego, you could think of it as the ego as an opponent of the soul self. But, but is it really? Or do we have to witness ourselves being enraptured and embroiled in the fight for survival so fully that we then see that it is ultimately fruitless in a kind of way and we lose valuable things we wanted originally if we remain in that unconscious battle. I just I think about this so often because as human beings we're just so right stubborn and kind of dense and rigid, you know? And you think about it when we we're here, right, on the human side is to get locked up into that so much that we're then thrust into having to open and embrace this idea of soul. And that would we even believe it if we didn't have to go through that, right? Is this how we make our way to the soul connection? By by immersing ourselves in the human one so completely that we eventually discover soul. We eventually discover a path that includes soul, and, you know, I often think, are there really any shortcuts to that for us individually? I like, can we hack that really? <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> but I spend a lot of time in here. I don't know. I'm thinking you might also, if you're listening this evening, right? I've spent a ton of time in here because I developed a very stubborn, a very entrenched ego self to get through my life. And sometimes I'm very sad. I, I cry about all those lost moments, the, the missed loving connections, the embarrassment of being clueless, and all, all that followed that. But I, I think the soul self isn't looking for the tears so much. I think those still are part of uh, the owning and claiming our human, right, our human experience. But I think the soul self is looking for the new wisdom that comes from it for sure. But but underneath, I think the soul self is waiting for us to love ourselves in spite of all the humanness of it all. 
I'm going to say that again. Underneath, I think the soul self is waiting for us to love ourselves in spite of all the humanness of it all. And, and therein, right, is, is, the, is a growth experience of bringing human and soul together. So to, the idea that we would personalize this idea of love rather than keeping it in the realm of ideology or imagination right? When I say personalize it, like it's right there. Like I am not liking all these moments that I blew, blew out of, like I didn't handle well, or I didn't, you know, I wasn't conscious inside of them. And so then however I treated people or however I handled that situation, it didn't, wasn't great, right? That's very personal. I have an opinion of that. I lived it. I feel it. It's in my body, right? And so inside of that personalizing it, I really have to bring love to that. I have to figure out how to actually bring love to that rather than just, you know, keeping this kind of, uh, I don't know, cool distance, right? In terms of more like how I think about it. Oh, it's all love, right? Think about it. It's one thing to think about the idea that love is in all things, but it's quite another to be within a millimeter of the moment when you don't feel very lovable. When your way of being has clearly left someone else with less than, and then you have to find a way to appreciate who you are and what was at play that left you with only that choice. Okay, I'm going to leave you with that thought. We're going to go to break here, right? Because we're talking about this idea that human and soul is about personalizing those places we don't love ourselves. The best of the holistic, spiritual, and conscious world. Om Times Radio, IOM FM. Ascending Hearts is no ordinary dating site, but a spiritual dating site with a purpose to link you with your soulmate. We engineer the serendipity so you can trust that you will attune with someone that has the same matching vibration as you. Ascending Hearts, the conscious dating site for the spiritually aware. Try Ascending Hearts for free. AscendingHearts.com My name is Victor Furman. Some call me The Voice. I've always been fascinated with human nature, spirituality, science, and the crossroads at which they meet. Join me Wednesdays at 8 p.m. Eastern on Ohm Times Radio, and we'll explore these topics and so much more on Destination Unlimited. If I could be you. And you could be me. For just one hour. If you could find a way. To get inside. Each other's mind. Walk a mile in my shoes. Walk a mile in my shoes. Walk a mile in my shoes. We've all felt left out. And for some, that feeling lasts more than a moment. We can change that. Learn how at belongingbeginswithus.org. Brought to you by the Ad Council. Walk a mile in my shoes. Well, hello, welcome back. I'm Sam Parado, and I'm your host for Expedition Self. And tonight, we're talking about human meet soul and soul meet human. So um, before we went on break, I was talking about what is actually happening in that, that stretch between human and soul. So I think the stretch between the human and the soul self leaves no survivors. (laughs) This is kind of odd to me. Like here we are as humans trying to survive, to eat, to sleep, to work, to exercise, to function. And in the end, because of our inner struggle between the human and the soul self, everyone, everyone will meet some sort of end, right? To their ideology, to their identity to their sense of how it was supposed to be by the time life gets done with them. And this, my friends, is why I believe there is a soul that goes with every human. You don't buy a bike without the wheels or (laughs) 
show up with strawberries and no shortcake. <laughs> this combination of a weighty, shapely and outlined, attention demanding, needy, attached to the passing of time physical life, and on the other side, the abstract, ethereal, unprovable sense of spirit and soul produces the angst and the battle and the losing and the finding ourselves over and over. And the pause that occurs when we are in some form of complete suffering and some kindness is offered and we notice it, we are changed by it. I mean, why in the heck would this happen unless there was in fact something more at play than daily living? So there you have it. The first piece of human meat soul. You can't explain our lives without acknowledging soul. You just can't do it. Like striving to survive makes no sense without connecting and adding the soul's presence and need to evolve. I just want to say that I think when we can manage this contrast in relationship and be open to it and seek to understand it without fully choosing one side or the other, right, without aligning with one side or the other, I, I think life goes a bit easier on us. Uh, and, and I can't prove that either. <laughs> I mean, really, some of the things I'm sharing tonight, I'm hoping that you're thinking about yourself. And maybe you're going, no, no, that's not true. But that's all right. Because right, the whole idea here is to start to open up this particular conversation inside of your own thoughts. I've often heard spiritual gurus uh, talk about how all events in your life are really serving you, even if they don't feel like it. And you know, I'm mostly like, I go with that, right? <laughs> I, I can jive with that, right? But I'm also a little skeptical of this too, because then it can seem like we might as well just accept it all. Like it's a fatalistic approach. And then where does free will enter in? You see, that to me is part of going inside is that you you don't land on this is the way it is. This is how it goes. No, right? You you really pull apart and stretch the, the big phrase in the last decade was you tease it out, right? Um, is that you really sit in there and think about, okay, I largely go, I go with this and I partially don't. So you can still see where I still am between these differing states. Like I'm trying to figure out how the conscious mind interfaces with both the survival self, the human self and the soul self. Like I keep grinding away on this idea that the that the self, the global self, right, the all encompassing holistic self is the center, like uh, the body of a butterfly, where the humans need to survive, right, revolves around one wing, right, and then cycles through the body, right, and to the other one that is the soul attempting to become itself. And then it all goes back again over and over. So like the more I appreciate that movement, also like a figure eight around the one side and then crossing over and then making its way around the other circle, right? Like the infinity symbol. The, the more we appreciate that movement between both worlds, then eventually they begin to come together, operating in less of a, I hope the word is bilateral way, and instead they begin to work holographically, one intersecting, overlaying, interweaving with the other. It's kind of like the way we often see an eclipse right, where the sun and the moon move together, and all of a sudden, the moon blocks the sun, right, but the sun is still there. S soul meets human, human meets soul. So I want to talk about soul meeting human. 
So the more we can allow the soul self to have a voice, to communicate with us through the experiences and the symbols and the unexpected discoveries, well, then the more the soul is welcome to bring its best. So again, we are asked to make a leap of faith, right? If we take the case there is a soul, there's a leap of faith that goes with it. What signs and symbols do you attribute to your soul self? Is it the unrest you feel when something doesn't feel quite right? Uh, is it the stranger who offered to help you during an afternoon when you needed it most? Right? Is that a sign? Is it the moment when you just haven't understood how to find your way through a challenge and then the answer suddenly appears as if it had been <laughs> sitting at your dinner table the whole time? A lot of my soul recognizers are found uh, by the through the unexpected offering or helping hand from people. Like, um, I, I still get this visual. I think I've actually talked about this on the show at some point, but it's the my mother's hand reaching for me. I could look up through the center of a, an inner tube with the water on top of me, and I could see the sunlight above her and her hand, right? And as I was heading, I was slipping out of that hole, heading for the bottom of the dock. And there was a, if you could picture the river, there was this like 20 mile an hour rate current, right? And there were a hundred inner tubers starting to back up against her and this dock and that hand grabbing a hold of me and saving me from drowning, right? It's, it's these, these unexpected moments where someone's just there, right? Or the that these are my signs. I think everybody has a different signs, right? Um, and so uh, the other one is an example is the boss that hired me with no skills and helped me start, you know, going to a therapist to talk about my, my inner world and gave me a sixth chance. <laughs> Imagine this after firing me five weeks in a row. <laughs> It also looks like failures, right? I have a number of them when I lost the thing I was going for or failed. And they and those failures often pushed me to regroup, rethink, surrender, find my heart, go deeper. I don't know. I mean, you, you could call it something else. But for me, it's a place where my soul self says, oh, there's there's more than than just living. Right? There's more than just going through the day. And, you know, it's going like that for me lately. Uh, I just want to share along this is like the last four years or so, the more I've tried to get new things going to fully embody what I feel like is my personal mission in life, you know, to like go to the next step in my my progression, the the more I tread water. And it has really caused me to bounce around <laughs> between soul and human and human and soul. And, you know, the human part of me saying, get with it, do more, right? You're not handling this properly. And the soul self saying, uh, yeah, yeah, but what fulfills, what fulfills you? Well, what has the kind of lifestyle quality that inspires and lifts you? And then the human self is like, no, it's just your pattern. You just say, gotta unwind this, work harder. And the soul self says, yeah, it's true, but let's do it with the whole, the whole of her in mind. Um, I I know you could say, well, that's just your mind having two, you know, two parts of the conversation. But I would say to you that what I'm aware of is that when I try the human side to, uh, what's the word I want to say? Um, force, right, or manhandle myself into being something. What I notice is that there's this just underlying hum that I have come to associate with my soul self that really, if I open to listening, often there's just something different there, right? Maintaining a relationship with the soul when you are struggling is not an easy one. And I think there's a lot of people out there struggling right now. 
And um, I think we're struggling in relationship. I think we're struggling to uh, make ends meet. I think we're struggling to deal with a world that looks very different, probably, than one that, that you existed in before, right? And all these changes that are going on. You know, there's this place where the feeling of no boundaries, of transcending the past, the present, and the future, it doesn't know how to fit inside the confines of an hour or a day. Now, remember, this is a soul meet human, <laughs> right? What I'm trying to say is just for a moment, imagine yourself in this soul space and, and you're trying to fit inside the confines of this person's life experience. And you're trying to fit in the confines of how, how to beam, how to shine, how to glow, how to emanate, right? <laughs> Just for an hour, let alone a day or a year. So, so this middle intersection point where the human self and the soul self seem like they're not on the same page, this is where I think the leverage point is inside of us. It's the place where we bring the consciousness to the moment and say, well, I do need to understand this pattern better. I can do some more work on the way I protect myself in life. And I, I, I am defended. All right, let me see another layer of that. I can open up more about my sense of belonging. And at the very same time, I would be saying, whatever you get to, it's enough. You're browbeating yourself to go faster or smarter or deeper. It's not going to change a thing. Your soul self is waiting for you to land on a rhythm, a routine that serves the whole you, not just the survival you. And when that happens, it'll feel different. You see, that's the thing. And, and I wonder if you've noticed it too. <laughs> when the human and the soul are in sync, I think it feels different. Like freer, uh, more at peace. Uh, the wisdom kind of shows up. Uh, the fight goes out. You're, you're, there's an inspirational element. You're ready. You're a yes, <laughs> right? Um, and, and yet you're not like a blind yes, right? Like, go for it. No, you're accepting to while the human is raging about what it all means and how to get to the finish line, the soul self is holding the space, waiting its turn to be heard. And I can just tell you, it's easier if you learn to listen <laughs> sooner. It doesn't mean you won't still go through the experiences. Remember, we said this, this stretch between the two is the very point of it all, right? But I think it has a quality of feeling uh, like more purposeful or it has a sense of meaning, right? When we listen sooner because the, the soul self wants your human self to accept what it is. The soul self wants your human self to accept what it is. Human, physical, emotional, sensitive, feeling, thinking, and sensing. It wants it to accept it. See, this is what I found. Every time, every time, without fail, I accept another aspect of what it really means to be me, to be a human, not what I want it to mean, not how I want to look. Every, I, every single time I accept what is so about me, the soul self gets to now help me because I make more room for it. Now think about that. It's a really interesting equation. Accept all the stuff you don't like about yourself. And the next thing you know, the soul self's going to be there to help more. Wow. Like just, right? Just think about that for a moment. It looks like it's uh, an oxymoron, like it shouldn't work that way. Right? It looks like the more you go after the self, soul self, the more you do that, then you don't have to 
feel so bad about being a human. Right? You don't have to feel so bad about being a human, but that's actually not how it works. Right? It's actually the more you go after what's really human for yourself, the more that happens for you, then the more the soul actually gets to enter your world and it gets to get heard and work with you. <laughs> human meet soul. So these lessons or learnings I'm gaining, well, they don't come without the activity of your life. It doesn't matter what you do. You're going to meet your soul because every human comes with one. <laughs> I hope this is kind of sinking in, like you're with me about this, right? I, I don't think these conversations are ever quite so easy to do uh, just with words, right? But what we're really saying is, that you're going to meet your soul because it comes with the activity of your life because every human comes with one. All right. When we come back from break, we're going to talk about the sense of soul and how you know it's there. The best of holistic, spiritual, and conscious world. Om Times Radio, IOM FM. Host your show on IOM FM, the radio network of Om Times Media, one of the more recognized brand names in the conscious community, and is backed by the extensive marketing reach of Om Times. Hosting a show on IOM FM immediately connects you with our extensive, dedicated community. Hello, I'm Sandy Sedgbeer, host of Om Times Magazine's flagship radio show, What Is Going On. My passion is sifting through information, research, and innovations from new thought teachers, speakers, and researchers pushing back the boundaries of what we know about life, energy, metaphysics, and the universe. I love shifting perceptions about who we are, why we're here, and how quickly impossible becomes normal when we open our minds, expand our awareness, and accept that the only limits that exist are those we place upon ourselves. So if you're the kind of forward-thinking, eager investigator of what lies beyond the current reality that most perceive, why not make a date to come play with me in the field of possibilities at 4 p.m. Pacific Time, 7 p.m. Eastern Time every Thursday. And together, we can discover what's really going on. You came across someone struggling with hunger. How would you recognize them? Would you notice an eight-year-old girl who's, who's not, not excited, excited for, for summer, summer break because she may not be having lunch again until September? Or a war veteran who's, who's having, having a hard, hard time, time landing, landing a job and getting back on his feet? I am the one in eight Americans who struggle with hunger. I, I am, am hunger, hunger in, in America. America. Hunger can be hard to recognize. Learn why at IamHungerInAmerica.org. Brought to you by Feeding America and the Ad Council. All right, we are back. I'm Sam Parado. You're listening to Expedition Self, and we are talking about human meet soul and soul meet human. So uh, this was where we said we were going to go next after break is where does this sense of soul live within your psyche, right? How do you know it's there? I, I do think the soul self sometimes asserts, its, asserts itself at the most important moments. When you're about to make a left turn, that's going to be really hard to recover from, right? So is it that voice that says, get up, you want this, even when you're dog tired, or it's the part of you that says, don't let this happen, right? You just knew you had to intervene. And I, I guess I'd ask you the question, when these things happen, do you actually give credit to soul or do you make it out to be how smart you are or how you are so gifted and talented? I, I get stuck on this sometimes. I'm busy trying to make it seem as though so soul isn't real. You can hear in my conversation throughout this whole talk that I am talking about that there is soul, right? But the rest, the rest of me is always spending time going back and forth and back and forth. There's this part of me that gets caught up in being human. And I start to feel silly for believing in my soul self. So then I start to debunk it. <laughs> Maybe I'm imagining it so because it gives me comfort or because I don't like feeling powerless. And this gives me a sense that I'm more than me, right? Or it's not like I can really count on it because it's not going to put food on my table or pay the mortgage. See, the skeptical part of us or of me is human. 
the soul self kind of smiles and waits its turn <laughs> because eventually we will hit a part of life and it will be needed whether we acknowledge it or not. And remember, every lifetime eventually brings those two things closer, right? Human and soul, right? If you land on one side of this, like the human side, it will debunk the magic and universal knowing of the soul self. If you land more heavily on the soul self side, you'll decide that you don't have to feel or be in the real humanness of life and everything is beautiful and, it, and it's all wonderful and reality <laughs> will maybe not be quite the part that you acknowledge or deal with. You'll just turn the other way, and pull the shade down and acknowledge only that which feels spiritually peaceful. Well, which way do you lean? Human meet soul or soul meet human? I hope this is making sense, right? Do you lean on the human side and you have to work with soul or do you lean on the soul side and you have to work with human? So I want to ask you in this moment, what are three of the lowest points of your life? And what are three of the highest and what did each have to do with surviving in life in a very, very practical way? And what did each have to do with feeling loved, accepted, valuable, and wanted and resulted in you feeling more connected to life, more connected to all the beings in the world? When the soul self is overlapping the human self, I think we can see more than just the facts about what happens. We tend to look for more meaning. We ask more questions that go beyond the, like the first assumption. And we, we look for the gifts that are embedded in all the circumstances and moments. Like we seek to bring more honor and reverence to our existence. We uh, apply ourselves to seeing the sacredness or being in it, or with it, or causing it, right? And we have more courage to see the things we think are unacceptable and undesirable. Well, because our sense of self, it, it isn't only found in our actions, but in our hearts, and in our souls. So I want to pull out a few ways to keep an opening for this potential integration and overlap. You know, ways of being you can nurture and cultivate right, to aid in your listening to open to the soul self. The first one is empathy. Anytime you can find empathy, softness, understanding, a desire to validate your existence, you are creating a pathway between human and soul, right? It can't be fake. So this is where my favorite stuff comes in, like growth work and going inside, because you can't just manufacture empathy. You have to feel it. So if you're going to look in the heart and it's cold down there, then it means you've locked up somewhere along the way. It means you put some stuff in the freezer and the temperature dropped. And if you can't find empathy, well, your soul and human will have trouble finding each other in a way that feels uplifting and as helpful as it could be. Remember where I went. It's like, Learning how to love the human self actually makes room for the soul self to come in. Empathy, by the way, does not mean like letting off the hook of personal responsibility. It does mean that you aren't sitting in judgment and you're not passing moral <laughs> like viewpoints on yourself or others. I, I would even say that if you can't find empathy for yourself, you'll never actually want to be personally responsible because it's too painful then right? You're, who, who wants to put their arm up and say, hey, I'm going to take responsibility for hating myself. <laughs> it, it doesn't make sense. But I, I do know it's about as human as, as burping. <laughs> and the second one, the second way of being is what I call attention listening. And I know it's, it's technically two words, but just so you know, I put a hyphen in between them. Um, but for my purposes, we needed both words. You have to bring your attention and then listen. I think a lot of times inside of us will bring some attention to something, especially if it's got some win for us, like a, a gimme, right, that we get to pocket about our sense of self, like it makes us feel accomplished or like the good person or essential 
or or something you know that we don't then listen right and we don't like to listen to i guess is what i would say right and so then we don't listen for all the slices of insight that float around it we just seize the feeling and take off and then we decide it's done and over with so attention listening is about saying i'm going to do this within me i'm going to practice and i'm going to capture what's there so i think about when people adopt like a practice of journaling they don't realize it when they start but they're giving their insides a place to put it all down and in the writing of it well then information appears so the attention is paid and then the listening has to happen uh, by the way Listening works better when you're not assessing everything you hear. So you want to really look at your inner botanist or beekeeper. <laughs> I, always, I always think about an aspect of myself who likes to catalog and categorize and study, uh, you know, like the, they're out in the nature, right? I've got one of those funky dome shaped hats on, the bee net is in my hand, and I'm, I'm wearing the, those khaki puffy pants and the jacket with the patch pockets, <laughs> You know, this part of me is good at paying attention and not so good at listening because the minute something is caught in my net, I want to quickly put a bunch of knowing on it and then my listening goes away. For years, I would ask for information from my soul self just before I went to bed. Before I fall off to sleep, I always see this very bright, brilliant white light shines right between my eyes. It's not I haven't ever seen a light in real life that was that bright, right? And I've always felt like that was my soul self time. So when I need to listen, I bring my attention to that moment and ask to be given something I can listen to. And sleep's really rich. It's a rich time for me. And I kind of think that my soul self gets a lot of room when I sleep and not as much, <laughs> not so much when I'm awake and doing my day. So for some people, you're able to do a better job listening when you go for a walk or take a shower or do the dishes. But the thing I want to say is that when situations happen that cause you to be unhappy, you'll want to listen and listen and listen because these moments are right for the soul self to make their way through the emotional layer. It's like the water gets clearer in these moments and churned up so the bottom can be seen the soul self. From my vantage point, right, it lives beneath the emotional aspects of the self. So if you bring attention and listening at very emotional times, and you don't get threaded up and just feeling it all and forgetting to notice, the soul self will show itself right then. And so this brings me to the next way of being this discernment. So what this means to me is that you don't just get a piece of information and publish it in your life. <laughs> Discernment is linking multiple pieces of information or patterning together and then sitting with it. It means that you don't get overly excited with the first aha and think you're done. It also means you're listening from, is this the soul self talking to me or what part of my human self is at play? Again, I watch people a lot just run with the first thing they come to. But if you're going to get more integration between the human self, the conscious will in the center and the soul self, you're going to have to learn how to discern who is speaking, who's at play, what's going on for each part. Remember, there's a lot of aspects of the human self to get to know by itself, right? So you want to try to try it on and take it off and try it on and take it off. <laughs> this is what discernment really means. You try it on and you take it off. Then you sit in it and you do it all again. And it synthesizes and it, it sifts itself through your whole self. And then you sit with it some more. So this kind of attention, listening and discernment, it creates a wide open corridor for your human and soul to meet and talk and explore each other. All right, the next one is wonder. You've got to wonder about it all. <laughs> and this curiosity, this watching and imagining and visualizing how it all works together, it opens up not just corridors, but vistas. Like wonder is this incredible, innocent, playful, experimental, uplifting game of 
of being. It allows you to laugh, to toy with, to lighten it all up, like to joke about it, to be amazed by it. Like wonder is like returning to the child within that didn't deal with barriers and boundaries when they thought about life. Now, this aspect of you is all about the moment and the present. So when you bring wonder to human or soul, you're going to get gifts like real ones. Okay, no, your conscious mind may try to bring cynicism to those gifts you get, like I described minded earlier, but the wonder is still the wonder. And it's not so far from the word wander. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. That's fun. Let's call it wandering wonder. Human meets soul and soul meets human through wandering wonder. (laughs) All right. And the last way of being is awe. When you walk in awe, A-W-E, awe, all the doors have the potential to open. I think about awe as the official acceptance of not being in control being a small part of something bigger than we can even fathom or understand. This awe reminds us to let knowing go, and it gives us permission to do so. So when we can be in awe, usually our precepts, our biases, our conclusions, well, they just can't stand up to the magnitude of what there is to be in awe about. So let me share a few of the ones that I'm in awe of when I need a tune-up. I can't believe I ended up here now with these people living like this. <laughs> the universe, it looks exactly the same as the inside of my brain. The cell in my body is the same cell that's found in every atom of the universe. I birthed a child. My heart beats constantly. I can't believe I'm in awe of the millions of live beings on this planet or how fast a hummingbird's wings move. And I can't even, I'm so in awe of like the heat of a volcano. I'll bet you have your own. What brings you awe? So I'm suggesting if you want to strengthen and widen and deepen your relationship between the soul and the human. First, you go for empathy, so things soften inside. Then you bring your attention listening to all the moments you can remember. And then you add discernment so that you're able to pick up which parts are communicating and in what ways. And then you bring wonder to it all and finally stand in awe of the very idea that human and soul coexist together and that this coexistence is the very thing that makes our lives more than just eating, sleeping, and breathing. Even though breath's really important. This coexistence is producing movement, even if we don't bring those five things of being like to the fore. But when we do, it makes things a bit easier because we, we are intentionally making room. And the soul or the human doesn't have to squeeze now into a hallway that's not big enough for it. So the soul lessons of life aren't about bypassing the human ones, right? They actually result because we fully immerse ourselves into them and then see what there is to see. When we make room for the soul, we make room for the edgeless, the incorporeal, the immaterial, ethereal, knowing that there is something at play in our life beyond the biological, provides us with an ability to meet the occurrences in our everyday that are difficult and confusing and illogical. So when we make room for the human, we consider that the qualities that we don't like are the very ones we want to embrace. And diving inside the human means we will embrace feeling, thought, senses, and then seek to disembowel false ideas of looking good and winning and survival-driven strategies. So I end today with human meet soul, soul meet human. 
Thank you for sharing this hour with me. I hope you have an awesome week. And I hope you're able to think about how to bring human and soul together. <laughs>